Cape Cod Canal. The ultimate seven-mile shortcut from Buzzard Bay to Cape Cod Bay now sees more than 20,000 vessels pass through it every year. But before the early 1900s, it was nothing more than a narrow strip of land. There was no canal, boats had to make the perilous passage around the back shore of Cape Cod, known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Mariners knew there needed to be a better way for boats to travel, and the idea to build the canal was hatched hundreds of years ago. Way back in the time of the Pilgrims, uh, Governor Bradford came down. They had come down to take a look as to see how they could get from Buzzers Bay uh, through to Bonstable Bay as it is. It was actually Cape Cod Bay. Uh, one of the big problems that happened over the period of years was that no one could come forward with the real amount of money that had to be done to do it. The one person who was the glue that kept everything together was DeWitt Clinton Flanagan. He was the man that got Augustus Belmont and talked him into building the canal that we see behind us. It's very interesting to note, before Belmont got on board and guaranteed that he would finish the project, there were probably 10 major companies that had, had, an had made an attempt to dig the canal. You had August Belmont Jr. out of New York financing the project with his lead engineer, William Barclay Parsons. Uh, they started working on the canal in 1909. They had a ceremonial first shovel full on June 22, 1909 in Borndale. It took Belmont's company five years to construct the waterway using a variety of dredges, a total of 26 throughout the years. They encountered numerous large boulders along the path, more than they anticipated. Once they started to run into these boulders, they were absolutely humongous in size. They probably were close to 20 tons and they had to be broken apart. And what was happening was that some of the dredges would make an attempt to move them and they couldn't move them. And unfortunately, then they would break the dredges. That really slowed down progress because they had to dynamite uh, the larger ones to be able to get through. But to pick up the pace in the dry section, uh, they created these little work areas where they employed steam shovels and set up narrow gauge railroad tracks so railroad cars can remove the material that the steam shovels would dig. Belmont's company uh, constructed three bridges, railroad bridge, a Bourne and a Sagamore drawbridge so they could reconnect the Cape after making it an island. By April 1914, only one dam called Foley's Dyke separated the waters of Buzzards Bay from Cape Cod Bay. With the opening of the canal in sight, Belmont famously blended bottles of water from both bays before opening up the last sluiceway and Foley's Dyke was removed on July 4th, 1914. This is an image of Foley's Dyke after it was taken down. The waters poured, crashed through as they met um, at this dike. I guess what had happened is the contractors removed uh, the top few feet of the earthen barrier and then the water did the rest and the roar could be heard um, from miles away reportedly. On July 29, 1914, the Cape Cod Canal officially opened as a privately operated toll waterway. 17 days before the Panama Canal opened. There was a festival of boats to celebrate, and luminaries such as Assistant Secretary of the Navy Franklin Delano Roosevelt showed up to see the new canal. Even though Belmont's canal effort was impressive, the project was fraught with problems in the ensuing years, and the canal didn't garner the revenues and amounts of boat traffic that investors had hoped for. Belmont's Canal failed for a few different reasons. It was a combination of factors that led ultimately to the financial failure of the canal. Um, first of all, the size of the canal was much different than you see today. His channel was only 100 feet wide. It was supposed to be 25 feet deep, but he, he struggled to keep it at that depth. He had lots of problems with erosion and shoaling. Um, that combined with the strong current that we see going through the waterway. We had narrow openings, or he had narrow openings underneath his bridges. They were all movable bridges, draw bridges. So you had conflicts between vessels and vehicles. So every time a vessel needed to go through, the bridges were up, which mean vehicles had to wait. Um, and then he also had some problems with um, the approach channel in Buzzards Bay, which back um, in the early years had to take a boats had to take a series of turns to come into the land cut. Belmont eventually sold the canal to the federal government for $11.5 million in 1927, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was directed in 1928 to improve and operate the Cape Cod Canal. The government found out that it, it could run the canal, but there was a number of things that had to be done 
to straighten out the problem. And one of them was a widening was necessary. So by the early 1930s, there was minor dredging that went on. And so consequently, the thought then was that they had to put in a series of better bridges. And the better bridges that they had to be in are the one that you see behind me, which is the Sagamore Bridge. The National Recovery Act of 1933 provided $4.6 million in federal funding for construction of the three bridges and other canal improvements. The Sagamore Bridge and the Bourne Bridge were both open to traffic on June 22, 1935. The bridges each have a main span measuring 616 feet between the centers of support and a vertical clearance of 135 feet above high water. Later that year, the Vertical Lift Railroad Bridge with a 544-foot horizontal span opened and saw the first train roll across its tracks. The bottom line is that the canal, once it was taken over by the federal government, finally became the canal that was envisioned by Belmont.